going to say too much about this guy's story, but there is a story, and you'll soon understand why we asked him to come talk to you about the topic of love. From Halifax, Nova Scotia, Scott Jones. Wow. Bonjour, Montréal. Comment ça va? <laughs> and that's all I have in French right now. I'm really sorry. Um, uh, merci beaucoup. Oh, one more. <laughs> uh, to Louis Felix and to the Creative Morning team for inviting me here uh, and for going to the trouble of flying me out from Halifax, which can be a bit of a pain. Um, it is a huge honor to be here with you today uh, to speak on the theme of love. Um, it's a, a really special topic for me uh, after everything that I've been through. And I, I have my own thoughts on love. And I know that we all have our own thoughts and, and love can be a very individual thing. So I'm just going to preface this talk by saying that this is my lived experience and you can take from it what you want. Um, so I have to admit that I, I did not really know what Creative Mornings was until um, I started researching it uh, a couple months ago, and I, you know, was excited, confused, and I had a lot of questions. And I, I started talking to Louis Felix about it, and realized that this talk was going to be different from any talk that I'd done before. Um, I'm so used to just sharing my story, and and that being it. Uh, but today I get to talk about what I learned about love in relation to my story, so I'm very excited. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to I am going to tell you a little bit about my story um, because I know some of you may not have had the time to read about it online beforehand. But I, I also want to open this up into a, a discussion by the end of it, um, just so that we can share ideas about what what love is for for each of us. And if you have any questions. Um, maybe think of them now so you can you can ask me at the end. So my name is Scott Jones and I am originally from uh, Nanaimo, British Columbia uh, on Vancouver Island and I was born into a family of of uh, four, four siblings, so three sisters and me, uh, which can be scary. Um, the only boy in in the family of and ma and a single mom, uh, and as a kid, I think I I I I was a nervous kid. I was running around all the time. My mom used to have to tell me to sit down to eat my my food because I'd I'd just be running around the kitchen in circles, uh, eating, and she'd be like, Scott, just chill, like sit down, enjoy your food, um, and this is what it was like for me. Uh, I think I was just a little bit nervous socially and I would you know struggle to to be myself from a young age and I, I'm sure we can all relate to that um, and when I was 10 years old I moved from from British Columbia to Nova Scotia and how many of you have moved during your childhood like a big move okay so you know how how challenging that can be and 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 the the fears associated with um having to say goodbye to your friend group and create all new friends um especially when you're you're really young so moving from from BC to Nova Scotia was like moving to a different country because they're completely different um culturally same country but completely different um and at that time, I started to realize that uh, I was different from everyone else. Um, and I was growing up in, in a small town in Nova Scotia. And I started to struggle with my sexuality. And it was in Scottsburn, which is about a town of 500 people. So you can just wrap your head around that. Uh, I was probably the, well, the only gay kid that I knew of. So this was a fear that, that followed me around. And in high school, I, I didn't really have a, a safe spot for me. Th 
the one safe spot was outside of high school in choir. I loved choir. Um, choir is cool. You should join a choir. <laughs> um, and it was the place where I felt like I could really be as close to myself as possible. And it wasn't until I moved away uh, to university that I, I realized, okay, it's time it's time for me to come out of the closet and, and be open about my, my sexuality, which was really hard because everything and everyone in my town basically said it's wrong to be gay. And so I had a lot of fears associated with my sexuality. And uh, when I talk to, uh, I do a lot of speaking with, with youth. And when I talk to youth, I talk about feeling like I was Aladdin in the cave of fears, the cave of wonders, sorry, but instead of wonders, I was surrounded by my fear. So it was like just isolated, separate from, from others, and I didn't share, I didn't connect, I didn't open up. And the first person that I decided to come out to when I was in university, um, it went something like this. So I was in the dorm room, and I'd spent maybe a month searching for someone to to be open with. And finally, I'd picked this person. And I, I said, I have something that I want to tell you. And I think she could tell that I was really, really nervous because she, she said, oh, no. You're not attracted to me, are you? <laughs> I'm like... No, no, it couldn't be more opposite to what you're expecting. And so I was like, okay, like, th this is going to be easy because I'm not attracted to her. And I'm like, no, I, I, I'm gay. And her response was the opposite of what I was expecting. And I, I kind of been searching for this person and, and thinking that she would be, you know, the perfect person to tell. And her reaction was, oh, and she took a step back. And, you know, I could tell that she was not okay with my homosexuality. And she said that she didn't agree with it. And I left that dorm room feeling very afraid, feeling like I wasn't going to ever find love or a, a loving environment where I could be 100% who I am. And I moved around after that. I moved to, you know to different cities across Canada and every time I would move it would be the same thing I'd have to go through this process of searching for people who uh, would love me you know and, and would accept who I was and um, I remember living in, in Winnipeg for a while and finding that challenging as well and and, and having and the same having the same type of situation where I tell someone and they wouldn't be okay with it, um, and then after Winnipeg I I moved to to Montreal for the summer, and it was like the complete opposite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> woo Montreal, you know how to love. And I didn't know that there was a gay village in Montreal until I moved here, and I start I just saw so much gay around me. And I was like, this is amazing. I can just like walk down the street and be myself and like wear a pink boa and just be 100% gay and, and love it. And just, uh, just to uh, uh, correct myself, I know that that's not what being gay means, but you know. Anyway, the point is I felt very free to be myself um, and it was a big contrast to any other experience that I'd had. And from Montreal, I continued to move around. Um, I lived outside of Canada and uh, experienced the same type of challenges. And it, w it wasn't until I was working in South Korea as an English teacher, you know, w working at a, a, a place of work where if I were openly gay, um, it was grounds for them to fire me. So I was very much in the closet at that point um, in terms of my work. And I reached a point where I just kind of had enough. And I'd, I'd said, I'm really, really tired of carrying this fear around me, uh, fear around with me. 
and not addressing it. <laughs> I think they're tired of fear too. <laughs> um, and so I moved home. I left South Korea and I moved to New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. And I was struggling with the idea of moving home back to the place where I, I felt like I couldn't really be myself. But I felt like I, I really wanted to give it a try and, and try and make a change. And so one night I was walking with um, my friend after a night of celebrating. And I had my arm around his shoulder. And I was, I was walking down the street. And we crossed the street and a couple of men crossed the street as well and they were shouting things and they came up behind me uh, one of them and said something in my ear and then all of a sudden I was on the ground and I couldn't move my legs and I tried really really hard I remember in that moment being really scared and 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 thinking okay I need to I need to do something to not be swallowed by my fear I need to focus on my breathing so I started thinking okay breathe in Love, light, positivity, and breathe out <sighs> fear. And I kept doing that. And all the while, I kept trying to, to move my legs, and I couldn't move my legs. And eventually, the police came, and the ambulance, and they took me to the hospital. And it, it wasn't until I was in the emergency room that I started to piece things together. And, and I, I, I remember being turned over on my side and hearing the sound of something running down my back and realizing it must be blood, thinking that, you know, something had, had happened. Um, and I started to connect, you know, maybe, maybe I'd been stabbed. Maybe something horrible has happened here. And they, they airlifted me to Halifax and told me that I had been stabbed in the back and one of those times the stab wound had gone through my spine and that it I probably wouldn't be able to walk again. And I remember that moment as clear as day because my sister was was standing next to me, my oldest sister who, you know, we all look up to and she's like a rock, she's really strong and she just broke down and started crying. And that was like a shock that woke me up, I think, from from this horrible situation. And I realized, OK, this is this is actually happening. I actually have been stabbed and I'm, I'm paralyzed. And then things started to change. They moved me to the hospital room. And from that moment on, I remember I can I can when I think back on that time I can almost see the love that came in through those hospital doors and I, my dear friend who is here today who I I, I would love to just thank publicly Charlotte Marchessault flew out yes I still haven't listened to that phone call that you left on my voicemail, but it was like, I don't know, crazy, just like screaming, crying, like, what's happened? She flew out from Montreal to Halifax to, to be with me during that time. People from all over in my life were, were flying in or, or sending um, notes of love to be with me and, and to help me through such a horrific time. And... Um, I, it's almost as though I can see this this wave of love that really began in that moment. And one night I was stay I was up late with my friend uh, um, who w went to art school and she was she was helping design a button, um, which I'm sure is impossible to see from where you are because it's tiny. But yeah, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> it is this design, um, and she put she put. Uh, she had a few designs and she asked me which one I liked and she was making it for the button was being made for an event that was to be held to help raise money for my recovery. And so I, 
I chose this design and she she asked what message I wanted to go on the button. And in that moment, I was thinking back on the attack and how afraid I was. I was thinking back on my whole life and how afraid I've been to be myself. I was thinking about my family and how afraid we were in this moment and my community and how afraid we were of what you know had happened. And I just said, I, I don't want to I don't want to be afraid anymore. I spent too much time being afraid. And so initially I'd said no fear and that was going to be what we put on the button but then we remembered that no fear was the name of a clothing line from the 90s. So we went with don't be afraid. And uh then um my dear friend Charlotte again enters the scene and she paints this design onto canvas and goes around Montreal and starts a photo campaign and she she asks people to pose with the sign and you know give a statement of solidarity and she uploaded it onto onto Facebook and it's amazing what happened as a result people from all over the world started responding to this photo campaign sending in their love making their own signs, you know, sending in their own statements of of love and support and I can't tell you how incredible that was to have that love coming in toward towards me from the outside world because in that moment I was confined to my hospital bed. I really felt like I was never going to get out of that bed um and that I would never walk again. And so and I before I loved to travel, I loved the world and and different cultures and so seeing these messages of support and these photos coming in from other countries w- was really really a, a huge part of my recovery and a- and I get emotional thinking about it. And that's another way that I feel like this wave of love has just really been been pushing me along and helping me survive such a horrible thing. Um and it's been an incredible journey this don't be afraid campaign it because it's now a campaign it turned into a campaign after the photo campaign we started holding events um around Nova Scotia and then w- we held events across Canada and now we have a choir called Vox a choir for social change um and we we meet every week and we talk about ways that we can use music to um to break down barriers and 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 love each other more and often when i do talks like this i talk about just not being afraid and the fact that i've been afraid my whole life but for this talk you know being on the theme of love i was thinking i've been thinking about love for the last month it's been really wonderful w- you should all meditate on love every day uh because i was like what am i going to say like i normally just talk about you know my story and and but how does my story relate to love aside from the obvious and the thing that i often forget to mention is on this journey with fear what what does that actually mean what does what does it mean that i've been afraid to to be myself um and maybe this is obvious to everyone else except for me but i've been afraid to really love myself regardless of what others think of me i've been petrified of just accepting who i am and being okay with it and 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 loving who i am and so really this this campaign don't be afraid which is an anti-homophobia anti-transphobia campaign really what it's truly about is is not being afraid to to love yourself so that you can love others and i love the the analogy of um you know when you're on a, a, an airplane and and the flight attendant is telling you if we're going down you have to secure your air mask before you secure someone else's and 
not that I think that we're going down as a society, but I do think that it's important to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. And I, I know that's cliche, but it's cliche for a reason. And I feel like th- I, I wasn't taking care of myself. And I was thinking about others and thinking about what society wanted me wanted of me, what my family wanted of me, what, you know, friends wanted of me, uh, you know, that it, my town wasn't necessarily accepting of homosexuality. So I wasn't going to be open. I was going to stay in the closet. And I just think that that's so wrong. And I know that we, we all hopefully agree on that point. Um, but I think that that can translate to to everyone's lives. You don't have to be gay to understand this. You you can... I- I'm sure we all struggle with fear, whether you admit it or not. And I think we can all be more loving to to ourselves. And so that that is something that I often forget to mention. But since we're talking about love, um, and uh, this this wave of love that I mentioned that, that started in in October of 2013 after my attack. Honestly, it's continued from f- until this day. And there's there's something so incredibly beautiful about being on the receiving end of that love. And I don't want to draw attention to what happened over here, but it's a perfect little example of you know something happening and a little community gathering around that person to help them get better and it's like that's what i experienced but it was coming in waves and i felt like i could feel the love and the th- the power of that love is astounding and i'm so i it's weird to say that i'm lucky after such a horrible thing happening to me, but I feel so lucky to have experienced that in my life. Not many people do. And thinking about the man who attacked me, Shane, I, I, I don't think he's experienced even a fraction of that love. And I think that that's why this happened. Because this man was forgotten about in his own way. And this act of hate was just a giant scream for help. You know, a giant scream for love. And his pain was passed on to me through that knife. You know, because he wants someone else to feel it. He wants someone else to 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 share his pain so that in, in some way he's searching for love. And this campaign, Don't Be Afraid to Love, is what has helped me journey towards forgiveness with, with Shane and, and realize, you know, wow, th- the powerful effects of love and where it can bring you and and opening my heart to, to loving someone who's done something so, so horrible to me. And I think that's the main point that I, that I think about with, in terms of this whole picture is where we are in society how does this all as as an activist i i want to think about love in terms of the work that i'm doing and i think we're really hurting as a society and it, you don't have to look far to realize that you don't have to look too far south to realize that we're really in trouble and that we're hurting and we're, and a lot of people aren't they're not loving themselves so that they can love others. You know, they're just pointing their fingers at others and, and, and calling people different as if that's a bad thing. And, and that's that as an activist, we're all activists in some way. 
the love in our, our work is demanding love, demanding love. So love yourself, but then demand that others love you too. You know, demand that the queer community is embraced and loved. Demand that people of color are embraced and loved and respected. Demand that women in society are loved and embraced and respected. And that's, that's the work that now from this talk, so thank you to Creative Mornings for inviting me to think about love for the last month and really apply it to my life. That's the work that I will be doing going forward is just thinking about what is, what is the role of love in all of this? Because so often I think we can get um, degraded to you know holding our placards and saying that we're right in, in what we think in activist communities and we forget to just follow our heart and, and follow with love and, and demand, demand love. So the, those are the main points, I think, that I've been riding this wave of love. Don't be afraid really means don't be afraid to love yourself. And put your mask on before you help someone else put their mask on. In other words, love yourself. Love yourself. Love yourself. Um, I I feel like I've been talking for too long, <laughs> and I feel like I I'd love to. I don't know if if this is a a good time to open it up into a discussion. I don't actually know how this works, so here is Louis Felix to tell me. You know how it works, Scott. <laughs> First, we thank you. <laughs> we thank you for this talk. That's how it works. 